for coming out. We have a wonderful speaker today, Dr. Mordecai Paviel, uh, who spent a lifetime looking at those people who were willing to risk their own safety, their own comfort, and maybe that of their families, of course, as well, to help others. Somebody who is the world expert on, on rescue, Jews from the uh, grip of the Holocaust. After writing about rescuers around the world and in various countries, now uh, in about a dozen books, now Dr. Padiel has come to write about rescuers within Germany itself. And that context is so interesting for various reasons, in part because that is where patriotism was a wind in your face and not a wind in the sails, as it was in many countries where uh, rescue would be understood as a resistance, uh, a national resistance. But here, this had to be resistance to inhumanity. As uh, Dr. Padio was just uh, saying, it was a way of saving your humanity and uh, illustrating that with the story of an Italian woman who was trying to rescue a Jew. And the Jew said, oh no, no, don't do that. You're risking too much. Don't put your place yourself in my place. You don't have to. And she said, you don't understand. I'm trying to save my humanity. Uh, so this is, uh, this is for me, and this is how it's done. So uh, with that, I want to uh, welcome uh, Mordecai Pabio to Florida State University. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. OK. Uh, I'm going to take that mic. Yeah. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, I didn't know what so long I had in Florida. I came down from the uh, New York area. I'm trying to have this jacket. I know it was like in the 80s. <laughs> and over there, it's like in the 50s or 60s. But uh, thank God we have air conditioning today in my modern period. But anyway, my talk is about Germans who rescued Jews. Uh, and they did that, uh, Germans from all types, uh, from all walks of life, and in all types of conditions. And I have uh, divided that into uh, certain, uh, in, in certain segments, certain chapters. Now, uh, why did I do that? Because I worked at Yad Vashem for many years, and I was in charge of the uh, department that dealt with honoring non-Jews who uh, helped Jews to survive. Okay, we called them righteous among the nations. Uh, which is an Hebraic term, which appears in the Jewish religion. And it also, uh, righteous among the nations always refers to non-Jewish person. Uh, so that's a rabbinic term. At Yad Vashem, we launched this program in 1963, and I worked there for 24 years. For 24 years and uh, among the thousands and thousands that we honored, we also have many Germans that we honored as righteous among the nations. And, uh, most people are not so much aware of that. Uh, when it comes to Germans, most people uh, recall uh, the story of Oskar Schindler because uh, Mr. Spielberg made a movie, a very successful movie, and he, and he showed uh, how this one man saved so many Jewish people. Uh, but uh, many people that I come across, and they ask me, are there, were there other Germans that uh, saved you? And I said, yes. And I say, uh, at Yad Vashem, we have so far identified over 600. And they say, surely 600 Germans? That's impossible. Yes. And there are more than 600 because we don't know all the stories. And we don't know because uh, the stories of rescue have to come from the people themselves. Uh, no one who hid a Jew in his home went and filled out a form and, and, and uh, submitted it to the archive department. Everything was top secret. So if the people don't tell the story themselves, we won't know. So today I will show you a few examples of how Germans saved Jews and they were honored by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. Uh, this is the title of the book that I wrote recently on this uh, subject. So not only Oskar Schindler saved Jews, we have some more Germans. 
So this is uh, the true picture of Kashimla, not the actor that you saw in the movie. He was a very flamboyant, uh, self-serving, hedonistic person, loved women, uh, loved the good life. His ambition in life was to be a playboy and live it up because life is worth living, life is short, you gotta make the best out of it and the heck with everyone else. That was his original philosophy, like, I'm not here to solve the problems of the world, I'm here out for myself. And he started his career on the wrong foot. He started his career by uh, becoming a, an agent, a spy for the Germans. He was living in uh, Czechoslovakia, in the country of Czechoslovakia, in that area where there was a large German minority. And uh, he spied for the Germans because the Germans wanted to take over that area. And later on, he spied for the Germans in Poland. And when the Germans conquered Poland, he, he came to the city where, which he loved most, Krakow. And uh, he was asking for some compensation because he had helped the Germans, the German military intelligence. And uh, they uh, confiscated Jewish property, uh, Jewish businesses. And he took over one of these Jewish businesses, which was producing pots and pans. Uh, from the enamel, pots and pans, and as you know, Napoleon once said, the, every army marches on his belly, and so soldiers have to be fed. And so with pots and pans, uh, there were many, uh, uh, he signed contracts with the German military to, put, to produce pots and pans, so the German army would have uh, food to cook for its soldiers. And he hired Jewish persons from the ghetto of Krakow, and they increased, and, and then uh, the Jewish people that worked there, uh, they saw that this man had, he wasn't like the other German administrators. Uh, he treated them very nicely. If someone felt that he was tired, he told him, go back to your barracks and, and take a nap. You look like you're tired. Or he would go around and say, uh, uh, here, take a cigarette. You know, in those days, cigarettes were worth more than gold. Or here, have some fruit. Uh, he was treating them, uh, he had a human feeling, a human stroke. Uh, so, when, finally, when, after a few years, the Germans decided to close his factory, because the Russians were getting closed, he decided he had to save his Jewish workers, because if he was going to release his Jewish workers to the, to the, to the SS, uh, they would be sent to Auschwitz and they would be gassed. So he devised a plan where he said, I'm going to remove my factory, and I'm going to transfer it to an area inside Czechoslovakia from where I come, and uh, I'm going to restore it as a factory producing ammunition, and I want all my workers to come with me uh, for the benefit of the German uh, war economy. And they told him, okay, Mr. Schindler, but you pay for it. He said, all right, I made enough money, and he paid for it, and he added some more workers. The end of the story is, when the war ended, he had saved 1,200 Jews. Uh, and uh, this is a man who was not cut out to be a humanitarian at the beginning, and he turned out to be the greatest, one of the greatest humanitarians, uh, that was Oskar Schindler. Uh, he never gave up his other, his other extracurricular activities. After the war, he went back to womanizing, he went back to drinking, and, uh, but, but he did, during the war, he decided, I, I'm, I'm a human being, and these people who are working for me and making it possible for me to lead a good life, they deserve to live. Uh, they deserve to live on. They have a right to, to life like everyone else. And if I can do it by bribing and juggling and lying and cheating to these other Germans and saving them, I'm gonna do it because these people have a right to life. So this is Oskar Schindler, and this is later on when he came to Israel uh, for the first time in 1962, and he was greeted, it was a tumultuous greeting at the airport uh, by some of the, the survivors of Oskar Schindler uh, who met him at the airport in 1962. They called himself Schindler Youth, in other words, the Jews of Schindler. So this uh, has been dramatized in a film, uh, and we know about Oskar Schindler. But then we have people uh, that saved uh, other Jews, and, uh, and we don't know so much of them. So I, I uh, divided them into different categories. Most uh, people in Germany who saved Jews is because they knew each other from before. 
And so they knew each other, and uh, either they became friends or simply acquaintances. But uh, when you know each other, then you see that the other person is a person. Uh, the, the Germans, the, I mean the Nazi regime, demonized the Jews. The Nazi regime claimed that Jews were actually, uh, were not human beings. Uh, they were of a different species. Uh, they were not only inferior, they were the lowest of the inferiors. So, but if you know someone, and if you know them for a long time, then it's very hard to buy that uh, propaganda. So here is a woman, Dorothea Neff. She was a stage actress. Uh, I also have people here from Austria, because uh, from 1938 to 1945, Austria was part of Germany. It had been incorporated to Germany. And the Austrians are Germans, I mean ethnically, okay? They speak the German language, and they are Germans. Uh, so it's a separate country today. But during the Nazi, the height of the Holocaust, Austria was uh, part of, uh, of Germany. Uh, just like uh, uh, Oskar Schindler, uh, is a German, but actually he was a Czech citizen. He wasn't a German citizen uh, because that part of uh, uh, where he was born was, uh, was uh, belonged to Czechoslovakia. I remember when I was at Yad Vashem, I had a Czech minister come to me and I said, I just saw the tree of Oskar Schindler, very nice tree that you have at Yad Vashem. Uh, we have trees at Yad Vashem for Westwood. It's just one mistake. It says Oskar Schindler and at the bottom it says Germany. It shouldn't be Germany, it should be Czechoslovakia. And I said, no, he was a German, so we go by the, the ethnic belonging. Yeah, but he was a Czech citizen. So anyway, <laughs> it's a little bit about history. But anyway, Dorothea Neff was a stage actress uh, in Vienna. And this is uh, some of the pictures I have here of some of the uh, uh, dramatization uh, that she did on the stage. And uh, she had, a, for all these roles, she had a costume designer by the name of Lily Wolf. And Lily Wolf drew the costumes for her. And then Lily Wolf was, was Jewish. And one day Lily Wolf uh, came to see Dorothea Neff. And she said, I got a summons to report uh, on the train in Vienna to go someplace in Poland. And uh, they told me I could take uh, uh, two suitcases, two small suitcases. And it has to be uh, a certain amount. It cannot be overweight. It's got to be like uh, uh, 50 pounds each. Uh, and so since I don't have any scales, and you have scales, can I come and bring the stuff that I have to take with me uh, to weigh them? And the hotel said, yeah, come over. So she came over, and they started weighing, you know, to pair of socks, a towel, a dress, underwear. And then the said, Lily, stop it. Just stop it. You're not going any place. You're staying with me. You're staying, I got an extra room in my apartment. And she hid Lily Wolf for three and a half years. While Dorothea Neff went and performed on stage, or she performed before German soldiers. Uh, she, she was living in, 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 in what was Germany. And she saved one person for three and a half years in the back room of her, her apartment. Uh, during, uh, sometimes during the opening nights, she had to invite people at home you know, for cocktails and things like that, and so the back room had to be locked. And what happened to Lily Wolf after the war? After the war, Lily Wolf, here she is on the left, she moved to Texas, and she continu continued in costume designing, and she was costume designing for the Miss uh, USA pageant. And here is a costume that she designed for this lady, Miss uh, Kimberly, uh, who was nominated, who was elected as Miss USA in 1952. So Lily Wolf was saved by this uh, uh, Dorothea Neff, whom she knew from before because she was working for her as a costume. And she was one of the persons that uh, uh, she designed the costumes. Okay, Lily Wolf. Uh, here's another story. Here is this uh, lady, Irene. She worked in a circus. And she worked in a circus which belonged to her family, a Jewish family. And then the Nazis closed down the circus and they, they were competing with another circus uh, operation by this man, Adolf Althoff, on the right. And when they closed down the circus, she went to this other man, Adolf Althoff, who had his own circus, and she said, uh, I'm very good at rope dancing, and, and I know how to uh, handle horses in the circus. 
And uh, but uh, I don't know what to do. They closed down my my current circus, and uh, uh, they wanted to fault me. And he said, "You got to work for me." And uh, this is uh, Irene there on the extreme left hand side, and this is one of the men in, in the circus of Altov. Uh, and she worked there. Uh, what what she would do? Her act was to jump from one horse to the other while the horses were circling around. And uh, it was a good way to hide it from the Gestapo because that circus was always on the move from one place to another. So it was made it more difficult for the Gestapo to track down where she was. So she survived the war because she went to that man, Adolf Althoff, uh, whom she knew from before the war as a competitor to her own circus business, and he saved her. Okay? And of course he was honored by Yad Vashem. Elizabeth Abick. Elizabeth Abick was a teacher. She belonged to the Quakers. The Nazis came to power. She was fired. But then later on, she lived in Berlin, and uh, she decided that her home was going to be open for many Jewish former students of her school who needed a, a warm uh, plate of soup or dinner. So her home was always open to these former students, and uh, uh, she also helped them with money and also help them with uh, information of how to make their way to the Swiss border and try to cross it. So this is her on the left, Elizabeth Abick, and these are some of the people that she helped. This is a, her a little bit on the right hand side, on the extreme right, and some of the people who have come to celebrate her after the war. Again, a school teacher and former students, former high school students. Uh, dismissed by the Germans uh, in Berlin because she was a Quaker and she was a she had made anti-Nazi statements. Uh, Esther Zeidel plants a tree at Yad Vashem. Esther Zeidel, uh, I simply have her because she made a statement. She saved uh, again a person that she knew, a Jewish person, and. She made the following statement. Uh, during the Nazi period, I was not prepared to take any risks for anyone because I had my own children. But when it came to Elsa Wolfenstein, my friend, I was prepared to risk everything. She was not going to be harmed. And she took in her former friend into her home and sheltered her. So uh, that's one of the mo motivations. Uh, Otto Nordenberg and Henry former, uh, Wolfgang, is his uh, original German name, and then he moved to America, and he became known as Henry Lox. And this is from a German newspaper. Zwei Jahre unter dem Möbelwagen geboren. Hidden for two years under the moving truck. So what's the story here? The story here is that uh, they had met before when uh, Henry of uh, Wolfgang Lax had to move out of his home in Berlin because the Nazi said you have to move in in another home where Jews live. It's not a ghetto, but it's, they designated the street and said this is where Jews have to live uh, before they were being deported. Well, I have to move out of my home. I have furniture, so she checked. He checked the yellow pages or whatever. And uh, Otto Nuremberg was in the moving business, and so Otto Nuremberg uh, he hired Otto Nuremberg. Which Please move my furniture into that home where I'm not going to live. Sure. So he moved into that Jewish home, and he stayed there for about a year. And then he got a summons for deportation to Poland. He got a report, that the, and he said, wow, I don't want to go to Poland. I don't know what they're going to do with me. He, because uh, very few people, if anyone in Germany, had heard the word Auschwitz. Okay? Uh, it was not disseminated by the Nazis. But anyway, going to Poland under Nazi control, so he said, I'm going to check up, up on my friends. And uh, he checked on his friends, and everybody gave an excuse why they didn't want to help. And then he said, maybe I'll go to this other Nuremberg, the one who moved my furniture last year. Because I remember he made, once made a remark, uh, the, not, the Hitler, I don't know much, I don't know. I don't know whether, I mean, I don't know whether he's going to make it. So he made that snide remark. And he went to Otto Nuremberg, and Otto Nuremberg said, never mind, I'll I'll hide you. I'll hide you in my uh, old moving truck, which is no longer operating in the, 
Uh, then he said, I also have a brother. I'll take your brother in as well. And so uh, Oda Norberg uh, was honored by Yad Vashem. Now, I want to read with you together what Henry Lax wrote after the war. My name is Henry Lax, born 1914 in Berlin. Presently, that's 1973 when he wrote this, residing in Long Beach, New York. I am an associate research scientist at NY University. In February 1943, I managed to escape the deportation by incredible luck with just what I had we what I had we was wearing. A shirt, a sleeveless sweater, shoes, etc. I got in touch with all my Aryan friends, in other words, my non-Jewish friends in Berlin, only to be told with embarrassed excuses that I could not accept the risk of sheltering the Jews. In my desperation, I remembered Otto Norberg. He was in the furniture moving business and had moved our furniture when the Nazis forced us to give up our apartment and move into a so-called Jewish home. I contacted him at the last resort. Mr. Norberg did not send me away, but provided me first with clothes and took complete care and, chain and, char and charge. He reunited me with my brother who had escaped in a similar way. He then evacuated or emptied an underground cabin on his property, which was full of trash. It was accessible through a hatch, which was covered with a heavy iron plate. He put two cots inside, a knife bucket, and enough blankets to keep us warm in the cold winter. All the food was rationed and extremely scarce because of the war. He scrounged around for us and shared with us his own meager ration coupons. Otto Norberg was a Protestant and deeply religious. However, religion was not limited to going to church or had an obligation to help his fellow man. He and his wife never accepted any kind of compensation. I hereby affirm on the oath that my above statement is true. So, as a person whom he knew slightly, but not great acquaintance, a truck mover. Now imagine if any, God forbid, all of you are need help from someone and all your friends turn you down and then you remember a truck, a man who moved your trucks to a different apartment and he made some good statements like, I like to help people. And as a last result, you come to him and said, I need a place to stay because to save my life. And he said, you come to my place and I'll keep you and I'll feed you and so on. Unbelievable. Otto Nuremberg, have you been, have you been caught? And this is uh, Otto Nuremberg on the pictures on the right hand side and Henry Lax on the left hand side. Had he been caught, he would have gone to a concentration camp. Okay, some people held their spouses. Uh, so here I come to what Professor Stolzbos had written many years ago. Uh, it's very hard to understand today. I mean, it's mind boggling. If you were Jewish and you were married to a non-Jew, uh, during most of the time of the Nazi regime, you were not deported. Although they had passed a law in 1935, not in the Nuremberg Laws, which one of the provisions of the law was that sexual contact between Jews and non-Jews is forbidden by law. Sexual contact, you forbid, you go to jail or you go to concentration camp. So here you have thousands, literally thousands of Jews who are already married before the Nazis came to power and they were having sexual contact of, you know, day in and day out, but they, the Nazis did not uh, target them like they targeted uh, a Jewish person. Uh, and here I want to end in parenthesis. A Jewish person who had converted and become Christian and had become a priest or a pastor but if he had Jewish parents or grandparents, he was targeted. He was considered uh, dispensable because he had Jewish blood. The Nazi didn't care that he was a Christian. Okay, but if you were a full-blooded Jew and you were married to a non-Jew, then for some reason, and I'm not going to go into that because it's a big discussion about the Nazi policy. So then, in 1943, the Nazis decided after they suffered their first big military defeat in Stalingrad where the German army, the whole German army was obliterated in Russia, they decided they were going to pick up the Jewish spouses, the men that were married to non-Jewish women in Berlin. 
and they rounded up hundreds of these Jewish men and they were going to be sent to Auschwitz. And so something incredible happened in Nazi Germany. Okay? Uh, their wives, the non-Jewish wives, when they heard about that, they passed on the information one to another, and then they came to that street where most of the Jewish men were being kept, and the street is called Rosenstrasse, Rosen Street, and they stood on the street and began to shout, release our husbands, release our husbands. <coughs> That's before uh, their husbands were being sent to Auschwitz. Release a husband, release a husband. The Germans sent in police, they sent in SS, move on, leave, or we open fire. Never mind, release our husbands, release our husbands. Uh, so the Germans didn't know what to do. To shoot on the streets of Berlin with everyone watching, German women, Aryan women, members of the superior race, you can't do that. And so they moved it out from one official to the other, and it landed on Hitler's desk. And to the surprise of everyone, Hitler ordered, release, release the Jewish husbands. Release them. Uh, and then uh, Hitler was told, but mind fewer, some, about 50 of these Jewish husbands have already been sent to Auschwitz. Well, tell the commandant in Auschwitz to return them to Berlin. Unbelievable. On a thing which was so important to the Nazis, the Jews that had to be eliminated, hey Hitler, when he faces, I mean, imagine we're talking about North Korea. What would you say if you were to hear tomorrow that a group of women were standing in the streets of Pyongyang and saying, uh, Kim, our leader, stop threatening everyone with nuclear weapons. Stop, I mean, in Nazi Germany, to stand in Berlin and call for the release of their Jewish husband, the Jews were considered the greatest enemy of the state. The Jews were the ultimate enemy of the Aryan race. And they were calling for the release, and they refused to leave, and they succeeded in forcing Hitler to bend his will. Because as Professor Stolberg has written in a recent book, uh, Hitler was sensitive to public opinion in his own country uh, for tactical reasons, not for humanitarian reasons. But anyway, so this, this is known. Uh, so there was a, uh, this is a reenactment, a film reenactment that was done in Germany about the Rosenstrasse incident. The, the women standing there and screaming and the uh, police facing them. And there was a monument that I uh, logged down, I went on Google, and there was a certain monument, monument that I have seen on Google, but I haven't seen it in Berlin, uh, celebrating and honoring these women who protested. And they succeeded in releasing hundreds of Jewish men back to their homes in Nazi Germany, under the dictatorship of Adolf Hitler, that great humanitarian. Romance. So there are people who say others with whom they were in love, they were not necessarily married to them, but they were in love with them with the many stories, uh, which was forbidden on the law, of course. Uh, any type of relationship between Jews and non-Jews, any type of friendship or uh, going further than that, was forbidden. Remember the Nuremberg laws, sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews, uh, you went to jail. So here's one of many stories. This man sitting here was a musician. His name is Conrad Latzer. And he was passing under different names in Berlin. And uh, under fake names, as an Anjou. And finally, he got himself appointed as a choir leader for a musical band that was performing before German troops, because he was a musician. And he came there, and he had fake documents. And one of the singers there was this lady, Ellen, and some of the people there among the band suspected that he was not really Aryan, that he looked a little bit too much Jewish. So she stood up for him, and uh, she helped him to, uh, uh, to deny all these uh, allegations that he, uh, his, his records were in order, uh, I mean the documents. But people knew that a lot of people were carrying fake documents, so maybe his documents were also fake. So she stood beside him, Ellen Brockman, 
And after the war, she married him. Uh, she fell in love with him. She literally, she was a single there, and she fell in love with him, and she decided she was going to help him survive by helping him pass on his fake identity uh, to, to make it credible. And then uh, she came to Yad Vashem, and here is, she had about to plant a tree, or she had already planted a tree, and this is her here at Yad Vashem uh, about uh, 20 years ago. Romance. Okay, this is one of many stories. Oh, I'm sorry, I pushed. Oh, here's another famous story. Maya von Malsen. She was in love with this guy, Hans Hirschel. Really? Remember that song, Crazy Love? Crazy. She was definitely in love with him. She, she was, uh, he, he was Jewish. And she was not, so there's a problem. So uh, to solve the problem, she hid him. Where? In her couch. She had a couch, and uh, a, a reclining couch. And uh, on the, the back of the reclining couch, she, she built a, a double thing. And there, whenever somebody knocked on the door, he went in there, and the reclining couch went backwards. And he was there until the guests left. She was suspected by the Nazi because she had made an anti-Nazi anti, uh, statement. And uh, after the war, she bore him a, uh, she bore him, uh, a son. The son, uh, well, she had to explain when she bore him a son, who's the father? And uh, she had a friend uh, who happened to be a homosexual, but he decided that he was going to claim that he is the father and the son then she was registered under this other person's name while the real father was hiding in the couch uh, whenever the people came to inspect. Uh, after the war she married him and then she divorced him and she remarried him and so on. But that's a different story. But this is a love affair. What's interesting about uh, Maria von Malzen, her name is Maria von Malzen. She comes from an aristocratic family. Because everyone in Germany who has uh, a prefix uh, to the name, which starts with a von, with a von. It's like uh, nobility uh, or ancient nobility. Her, her sister was married to one of the most famous German field marshals, Field Marshal von Reichner, a great anti-Semite who commanded the whole German army in Russia and gave the order, uh, the order of the day to his troops that the Germans, whenever they faced Jews, they should treat them accordingly. In other words, they should kill Jews because they were, they were the greatest enemy of, uh, uh, of Germany. Now, Field Marshal von Reichenau did not survive the war. He died from a heart attack, but that's a different story. But when he learned that his sister-in-law was helping a Jew, he told her, Maria, you're doing your wrong thing. If you ever get caught, don't come to me for help. Don't come to me for help. So he kept the secret, she saved him. Romance, love. You love a person and you try to save them. Work, some people save people that they knew because they were working in the same place, okay? So we have Oscar Schindler, I again show him Oscar Schindler. Again, the people that met him in Israel, uh, some of his, of his former workers. Uh, this is the company that he had in, uh, uh, in Krakow producing pots and pans. Uh, the name of the company was changed from its original Polish name to DEF, which uh, are the initials of Deutsche Emeilenfabrik. Okay, and during the fourth year of the operation, okay, fourth year in 1939 and 1943, uh, all the workers uh, stood up in front of the entrance of of this firm. It said on top, "Vier Jahre, four years, DEF," and then the Nazi flag. Of course, that was obligatory. And they took a snapshot him and his workers. This is Oskar Schindler. Okay. Today you go to Krakow. Uh, the, that former firm has been turned into some sort of a museum, uh, telling the story of Oskar Schindler. Work. Berthold Weitz and his wife, Ilse. The Germans uh, occupied Ukraine, and there was one thing that the Germans were desperate very much. There's no oil in Germany. 
and without oil, you can't wage war. Tanks don't move, airplanes don't fly. And so they were desperate in oil. So it just so happened that in Borislav, which is in Ukraine, there were there was some oil to be found. And these oil had to be extracted and refined. And so uh, Berthold Bites was appointed, he was a civilian, to be in charge of the oil refineries in Borislav. And he decided he was going to use, choose from the nearby ghetto, there was a ghetto there, and that he was going to protect them. And he claimed that these these Jewish people that were working in the old refineries, they had experience, they were experienced workers, and he needed them, and therefore they should not be destroyed at the time when the Germans were killing all the Polish Jews. Of course, most, all of these workers, or most of them, had no private, previous experience in any factory work. Some of them were housewives, some of them were cooks, some of them were tailors, some of them were peddlers, some of them were merchants. Uh, but they worked in this old refinery, and uh, we're talking about over 1,000 Jewish people, battle bites. Uh, after the war, he was a uh, very well-known uh, industrialist, entrepreneur. He died last year at the age of 99. He was honored together with his wife. And this is the, their daughter. I think her name is Elizabeth. This is a wartime picture of, of, uh, of uh, Bertolt Bites, his wife and daughter. Now the point is here, here is a German who had Jews as slave laborers. Actually, they were slaves. And he decides, I'm going to keep them working for me. Because as long as they work for me, and they help refine the oil that is being extracted from the earth, uh, that is helping the German war economy. Right? So they're not going to kill these workers, because that will end the production and that cannot be done. So I will keep these people in my firm for as long as I can, and I will train them how to operate these machines, although they, have, they don't have the necessary background. So uh, in, in any other event, in normal situation, these people would never have been hired. But I'm doing it because that's, that way I'm saving them. Otherwise, they would be taken from the ghetto to the gas chambers. So he saved over a thousand persons that way. He had another one, Herman Graeber, who later, after the war, moved to California. He was in charge of the railway train operations in Ukraine in a place called Stolpunov. He also had hundreds and hundreds of Jews working for him. Uh, in order, you know, it was very important for the German army uh, in Russia. The Germans had a big difficulty that problem with logistics. Russia is a vast country, and the deeper the Germans penetrated in Russia, the deeper the problem of supplying their army the va uh, became a big problem. Uh, and so they had to maintain the railroad, the railway networks, and there were partisans who were sabotaging here and there. So maintaining the railways in Ukraine was a top priority for the Germans. So he was a civ civilian employee in that place, and he kept hundreds of Jews working for him on these railway establishments, uh, ostensibly for the benefit of the German army. But by keeping them there, he was saving their lives. Because in Ukraine, Jews were being killed, left and right, by the Einsatzgruppen, by the mobile killing groups. So in Ukraine, there were no ghettos. If you were Jewish, you were dead, uh, unless uh, you, needed, you were needed for a very important work-related uh, project like this one, the railways. I just have a clipping here, uh, one from an Israeli newspaper, the Hebrew, uh, the other one here, when he died, this is from the New York Times, an obituary, Herman Graeber, German, who saved Jews from the Nazis, and, this, and he died in California. Uh, and why did he move to California after the war? He moved to California, uh, After the war, he testified in the German courts against some of the Nazis who were involved in the killing of Jews in his area. And so he received threatening letters in Germany. So he decided, I'm going to move to California, and he lived out his life in the Los Angeles. And uh, a man by the name of Honecker wrote a book uh, on him. It's called The Moses of Rovno. The Moses of Rovno. 
Rovno is a city in Ukraine, and there uh, some, uh, were many of the Jews that he saved. He led them out from Rovno to his place, just like Moses led out the Jews from Egypt. So the title of the book is The Moses of Rovno. Herman Graver. Oh, Otto White. Otto White in Berlin. He had a company, he had a firm producing, guess what? Brooms and brushes. Brooms and brushes. Now, you know, the, every army needs brooms and brushes to keep its uh, quarters, its barracks, its base clean. Okay, anyone who was in the army, and I was both in the American army and the Israeli army. So one of the things that you do sometimes in the army when you take basic training, you have to brush and clean the floor and so on. Really brush and make it spot clean, especially when a general comes around for inspection. And so he had contract with the German army to produce brooms and brushes. And his workers were semi-blind Jews in Berlin. Now, if you were Jewish and you were semi-blind in Berlin, <laughs> your luck just ran out. Okay. You were no longer a productive person. And, but he kept them, uh, and they were producing, and his excuse was for the Gestapo, look, I just have an order from the German army, and I have to deliver on a certain date a certain amount of brushes that they need for some of their camps. Now, if you take away my workers, I'm not going to be able to do that on the deadline. And you're going to have to give me, you're Gestapo people. So you, you allow my Jewish workers. So here is a picture of him in his office, and here is a picture of him which, with, with Jewish workers. Uh, in, uh, it's called Blindenberg. Uh, Blindenberg means a blind firm. I mean, he, that was the title of his firm, a blind firm for, for brooms and, and brushes in Berlin. He couldn't keep them forever, but he kept them for two years. And finally, they took away his work. But for two years, he kept them alive. Okay, there's a limit to what many of these rescuers could do. Not everyone was successful, like Oscar Schindler, to keep them alive until the very end of the war. Okay, that's that's again White. And again, there's a romantic interlude there. He fell in love. He was married. Here at the bottom, at the right hand side, is his wife. But on the top right hand side is Alice Licht. She was one of the Jewish bookkeepers. She was not semi-blind. She had a full eyesight, and he fell desperately in love with her. Uh, and uh, it, it, romantic interlude, and later on, well, she moved to New York, she married a Jewish guy, and uh, then she moved to Israel, and uh, I, knew his, I, knew, I know her son. Uh, but when she was, uh, Alex when she was deported to Auschwitz, uh, she was not first deported to Auschwitz. First, she was deported to Theresienstadt. I wonder whether you've ever heard of Theresienstadt. It was considered a different type of, of ghetto than the ghetto that we usually know. In Theresienstadt, people could receive packages, food packages. Okay? And so this man, Otto White, who was in love with this Jewish woman, he sent her food packages, okay, without his wife's knowledge, to Theresienstadt, and when, and when you received the food package in the register, you had already postcards where you could reply and say, I received it, thank you very much. So these are the, uh, here, look at the bottom right. Here's a postcard with the Hitler stamp where Alice Licht is responding to Mr. Otto White in Berlin. And it says here, you see, on, that's the reverse of the postcard. It says on this day, uh, acknowledging received with thanks for the package that you sent me. So he was keeping her alive with additional food, because even in Theresienstadt, which was not as bad as Auschwitz, people were hungry. There was not enough food to go around. So an additional package of food uh, meant very much. Uh, so Otto White saved his Jewish semi-blind workers, and he was trying, and he saved uh, also the life of this woman with whom he was desperately in love uh, during the war years. So it's a mixture of both romance and this. Now here we have a problem here. We had a case of this man, Willy Friedrichs. Uh, he was in, uh, in a place called brest which today is in Belarus. And he was in charge of a firm which employed Jewish persons 
and he saved them. And this is one of the women that he saved uh, on top. So what is the problem? After the war, Mr. Willie Fridges returned to Germany. And uh, he had a home, and he, he couldn't meet his mortgage payments. So he decided to rob a bank after the war. And he came to a bank, and there was a man who was delivering money to the bank, cash. He stopped him, he pulled out a revolver, turned over the money. The man refused. There was a struggle. struggle. They both fell to the ground. The gun went off, and the man was shot. So he received a life sentence. The woman that he saved, one of the women saved, she appealed to Yad Vashem to have him honored. And we at Yad Vashem said, we cannot honor a man that caused the death of an innocent uh, banker because he needed the money. Or well, what we can do, we can uh, write to the German uh, Ministry of uh, Justice and ask for a reduction of sentence because during the war, he saved Jewish lives. So his sentence was reduced from life imprisonment to 12 years. He had already served 10 years, so after two years, he was released. And then uh, this woman asked Yad Vashem, can he plant a tree at Yad Vashem? We said, no, because he was not on it. So she said, well, I'm living on a kibbutz, and I will ask the kibbutz, and I will invite him. So he was invited to the kibbutz, and they planted a tree for him on the kibbutz. And so if you go to a certain kibbutz, and I'll give you the name later on, you can see the tree of Willy Friedrich, a man that saved Jews, and after the war, he, he caused the death of an innocent person. Uh, again, work-related rescue. That's the point. And there were sometimes sudden encounters. Like people who didn't know each other, they met each other suddenly. Uh, Kurt and Hedrick Schroeder on the left. What happened there? There was a woman in Berlin in 1942, and she was pregnant. She had not yet been deported. She was married and she was pregnant. And a, and a baby was born in December 1942. And something had to be done for the baby because they wanted to go into hiding. And to go into hiding with a small baby doesn't work out. Because when you go into hiding, you've got to keep total silence. You can't do that with a baby. So they were trying to give away the baby. So finally, they went from place to place in Berlin. And finally, the Schroeder couple said, we will take the baby, oh, we'll, we'll take the baby. And incidentally, they said, you and your husband can also come here. And so finally, the Schroeders, they had six Jewish persons in their home in Berlin. The interesting thing is, the Schroeders, their son was in the German army fighting the Russians, okay? And one day, uh, the son said, I'm coming home on leave. I got a 48-hour pass. And so the Schroeders told the six Jews, oh, you know what? I'm going to have to hide you in a, in a separate, they had a shack there in the back in the, in the yard because I don't know whether my son, what he would think that I'm fighting the Russians and my, my parents are, are keeping Jews. So it turned out that the son came home a day earlier to surprise and the Jews were still there and the son then insisted that these Jews stay there while he went back after his leave was over and uh, uh, he survived and I think he's still alive in Berlin. I have his address, uh, he must be in his 90s. The point is that this little girl, Monica, who was born in late 1942, and is living now in Livingston, New Jersey, and uh, some uh, seven years ago, I had a class at Drew University, and I invited her, and here she is sitting with me in the class. Monica, she's a teacher, she teaches. She doesn't teach the Holocaust, she teaches English literature, and uh, here is a Jewish child saved by total, total strangers. Total strangers. Here is uh, the lady on the left, uh, Mrs. Abraham. She also, she was pregnant and she was working for, in, a, in a factory in 1942 uh, before all the German Jews were deported. They had to work in factories. And on her way to the factory, she noticed that a, a certain woman was following her. And she said, why are you following me? And this other woman said, you're pregnant. And you're Jewish. She had the Jewish star on her. You need help. No, 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 I don't need help from you. I don't know who you are. You, you, maybe, maybe you're working for the Gestapo. I don't know. And then well, she continued following her. So to cut down the story, the baby was born in her home. 
in the home of this woman, Maria Nickel. So this is Maria Nickel on the right, and this is Ruth Abraham on the left, and this is the baby, and uh, Maria Nickel took charge of the baby, and the parents were able to find for themselves a separate hiding place without the baby. Uh, so Reha today lives in Queens, and uh, I know her. Uh, well, you can figure out how old she is. She was one year old in 1943. And her husband, uh, she teaches uh, Shakespeare in one of the schools in Queens. So again, people who did not know each other, but just one compassionate German woman. You know what she said when she followed this woman? Look, you're pregnant. And what month are you? Okay, so you're going to give birth when? Around December? That's Christmas. So I want to do a good deed for Christmas. So why don't you give birth to my home? I'll take care of the child. I want to do something good for Christmas. I'm a Christian. Religion. This woman on the left was married uh, to this man on the right. That's her too on the left. She is Jewish and he is not, but she is Jewish and for a time as I mentioned when you were married to a non-Jew for a time you were not deported but the Nazis changed the policy in 1944 in 1944 they decided again to pick up the Jewish spouses so in this case this is she so she's dressed as a nurse and her husband is a dentist and what she did she did the following she left a suicide note, like she committed suicide, and then she wandered off, and she wandered into the house of uh, this man here, the pastor, okay? This is an original, uh, her original true ID card before she changed it with the big J, and she said, I, I am a refugee, uh, I escaped from a, a, a prisoner, I'm a refugee from Russia. This is late 1944, the Russians were closing in, and I escaped from some place in Germany where the Russians are already here. I need a place where to stay. I'm not Jewish. But they suspected she was Jewish and they hid her uh, Ida Fluer. That's the, the name, uh, uh, that's the name, her, her married name. Okay, now, a new identity. There are some people who helped her with a new identity. Here is this lady, Margaret Bloch. Which who I knew, she lives in Australia now, in Melbourne. Uh, she, just, she was helped with a new identity, and then she uh, passed uh, three years in Germany. She would, this story takes place in Germany, uh, working as an au pair, taking care of children of other Germans. And she looked pretty Aryan herself. She was blondish, she had nice hair. She could pass as non Jewish. And here she is with the children that she is taking care of, the Kochanowski children. There she is going with them on vacation. So she is passing as a full blood, 100% Aryan, you know, blonde, light skinned, blue eyes. There were some Jews like this. And uh, the people that hired her as a housekeeper and an au pair, they knew that she was really not what she pretended to be, but they covered up for her and under the new identity. And there are, we also have stories of German soldiers who helped Jews. Okay, Albert Bottle. Albert Bottle, what happened? I'll make it brief. This uh, story takes uh, place in the Polish city of Przemysl. Przemysl, a big Polish uh, city. There was a big ghetto in Przemysl, and uh, the Germans were rounding up the people of the ghetto for final liquidation. Uh, it was 1942, the summer months of 1942, and Albert Bottel, a German officer, was in charge of 200 Jews who were doing a job for the German army. The SS came to Lieutenant Bottel, and they said, we are taking the Jews away. And he said, oh no, you can't do that. They are working for the German army. They have, to, they have a certain assignment, and they're not finished. The SS said, well, too bad. We got an order, all the Jews have to be taken away. And he said, I'm not going to allow this. I, I'm in command here, and these Jews, I don't discharge them. I'm in command. And they said, we'll see what happens. So on the day when they sent in some soldiers, 
And so Albert Bottle, I mean, the SS came over a bridge which leads into the ghetto. Albert Bottle stationed German soldiers and he told them to open fire on the SS if they tried to penetrate into the ghetto. The SS were advanced. He gave the command, open fire over their heads. The SS were stunned. A German officer with German soldiers ordered his troops to open fire on the SS over their head. They retreated. They reported, it was a huge investigation, scandalous. And finally, it came to the desk of none other than Himmler, the head of the SS. And this is Himmler writing to Bormann. Bormann was Hitler's private secretary. And Bormann once told Himmler, uh, the Hitler, the Führer wants to know, what are you going to do with this officer who ordered his troops to fire on the SS? And then uh, the, this is the letter which we found, the letter by Himmler to Bormann. Anyway, the man is going to be removed from his post. And after the war, after the, success, the successful conclusion of the war, the man will be put on trial. Okay, we know how the war ended, so he was never put on trial. Uh, and also, the last paragraph is, I have taken steps for this man to be discharged from the Nazi party. He was also a member of the Nazi party. Albert Butter. He saved the Jews that were working for him. And, uh, okay, on the left, uh, from a German newspaper, Israel Er Deutschen in Heidegger. Uh, Israel honors uh, a German in the Garden of the Righteous. You have Albert Bottle with his daughter in uniform. And um, then you have also Albert Bottle uh, before the war. And uh, he was an attorney, a lawyer uh, in the private profession. And his fellow commanding officer was Max Litke. Max Litke was actually the man in charge of the ghetto. And he also was involved in that operation. He also supported opening fire on the SS. He was removed, sent to fight the Russians. He fell into captivity and died in a prisoner of war camp someplace in Russia. His son wanted his father to be honored. His father was honored. And there you have his son, Yad Vashem, together with me. I'm about to give him a certificate of honor to, to Max Litke's son in the name of his father. Here is another German officer, Eberhard Helmrich. That's his wife, Donata. Eberhard Helmrich, what did he do? He was stationed uh, in uh, Drohovich, a certain city in Poland. Uh, which today is in Ukraine because the border has shifted. And he had a, a farm. He had set up a farm and he kept Jewish persons on the farm. The farm was raising vegetables and fruits to supply the German army. In other words, German soldiers, instead of getting food from Germany, uh, uh, they would be getting from farms here in Drohovich. And he kept it. Now, when they closed the farm, his superiors, some of the Jewish women there, he sent to his wife back in Berlin, dressed up as Ukrainian laborers with false credentials, and then she arranged for them to work as housemates in various German homes. So uh, that's him and his wife. He was a major in the German army. Again, soldier, work related. Here is Eberhard Helmrich on the right, uh, being honored by the Israeli consul Michael Arnon in New York in 1966. He later on moved to the United States. Anton Schmidt, okay. Anton Schmidt was a German sergeant stationed in Vilnius. And he decided he was going to help the people in the ghetto. By, he took them in his military truck. Uh, he had access to military vehicles and he took them to other places so they can, plan, uh, they can plan escape and they can plan a military activities against the Germans, Jewish people in the ghetto. Somebody denounced him. He was placed on trial, court-martialed by the German army and sentenced to death and executed. Before he was executed, he was allowed 
to write back the last letter to his wife. And this is some of the things that he wrote to his wife. My dear Steffi, I am informing you, my dearest, that my verdict has been announced today that I must part from this world. I am sentenced to death. Please forgive me. I did not want to cause you this pain, but unfortunately it cannot be changed anymore. I am ready to die, since this is the will of God and his will be done. After all, I have only saved human beings, even if they were Jews. And this was my death. Just as I have always done everything for other people, I have, always sacrificed, I have also sacrificed everything for other people. And the other world, I shall soon be in God's hand. I remain your ever-loving Tony. Tony, Anton Tony. Last letter to his wife. A German sergeant helping Jews sentenced to death. Hans Georg Kallmeier, a German official who was in charge in occupied Holland of deciding of cases where Jews claimed that they were not really Jews. What do you mean by that? I'm not Jewish. Well, just give you one example. I'm a Jew. I go to church. I go to synagogue. Very religious. But by your definition, your Nazi definition, I'm not a Jew. You know why? I was adopted by a Jewish family from an orphanage. My parents were not Jewish. They were Dutch. But they raised me in the Jewish religion. But my blood, I have no Jewish blood. By your own definition, I have Aryan blood. Why? Because in Holland, the Dutch were considered to be a lost Germanic tribe. They were considered aliens. So I'm an Aryan by blood. So never mind that I go to synagogue. But I'm not a Jew by your own definition. So bring us proof that you were adopted. So you got a fake document and this and that. It's a whole operation. So he was a German official who helped Jews with all kinds of fake documents to change their identity from Jews uh, to being non-Jews. How many people did he save? About 3,000 people. By simply changing their categorization from being Jews to being either non-Jews or even half Jews. In other words, not full Jews. Mix, uh, what the German, the Nazi term was Michelin. And to be uh, a not, uh, either uh, a, a non-Jew, of course, if you were a non-Jew by, uh, by their definition, then you had nothing to worry. Uh, and if you were a mixed half Jew and half Aryan, and you had Dutch blood, Germanic blood, you also were not, uh, uh, you were exempt from deportation. Uh, Hans Georg Karl Meyer. His son lives here in the United States. He, uh, he's an economist. He bears the same name as his father. Uh, this is on Karl Meyer. Here is a diplomat, Dukris Georg. He was a diplomat stationed in Denmark. Now, how come the Germans have a diplomat in Denmark, which, is, which they occupied? Well, the Germans, when they overtook Denmark, they invaded Denmark, and it just took them one day to take over Denmark. They claimed that we're not occupying Denmark. We're just here. We have soldiers here. And uh, you Danish people, you can keep your government. You can keep your king. You can keep your institutions. And we're not going to bother the Jews in Denmark. There were about 8,000 Jews. We're not going to bother them. No yellow star, no yellow, no nothing. That is known as the model occupation of Denmark. And that lasted for three years. And then in 1943, the Germans decided it's about time to pick up the 8,000 Jews. So uh, the SS, they ordered two ships to come into Copenhagen. Two ships, that's enough to pick up 8,000 Jews. They had a list. All the Jews were registered. And up until that moment, the Jews faced no problem. They went to their jobs, they had a synagogue, no restrictions. But that changed in August 1943. And so, since Denmark supposedly had its own government, and it was an independent country, although German troops were there, so there was a German ambassador in, the, in Copenhagen. And this man, Dukwitz, was the commercial attaché, doing business with Denmark. When he learned, when he learned that they were about to strike an operation, take away all the 8,000 Jews, he secretly he secretly uh, gave the information away, he blew the whistle secretly to the underground and Jewish officials 
told the telling them on September 2, two weeks from now, all Jews will be rounded up. And they didn't believe it. They said, it's impossible. We Jews are living free. Nothing is happening to us. We had no restrictions. He said, take my words. So do something about it. I have been in touch with the Swedish government. If you make your way to Sweden, they will admit you. Okay, to make a long story short, the Danish underground had picked up most of the Jews, 95%, and took them by boat across into Sweden, and all of them were saved. He's the man who blew the whistle. And he was honored by Yad Vashem. He later on became uh, the head of the Farm's office department in West Germany. And here we that Yad Vashem is being honored by uh, rekindling the eternal flame. A high official. Camps. Wilhelm Hamann was a communist, a die-hard communist, a German. And he was imprisoned since Hitler's uh, rise to power in 1933 until 1945. He was in a German concentration camp. Uh, and he was in Buchenwald, one of the camps. But he was an Aryan, so, you know, the Nazis, they had a great respect for German communists who were willing to go to concentration camp and not forego their belief in communism. Wow, that's a true Aryan. These are, they will, they will stick with the communism, although all they had to do is sign a statement and say, I hereby deny communism and they will never have anything to do. And the gate is open, you believe the concentration camp. But this guy really believed in communism. I don't know if you were alive today, you would still hold on to that, but in those days you still believed. And in Buchenwald, there were children that were brought in from other camps, young children, youngsters, and he trained them that they should they were, that they should not identify themselves as Jews. They should identify as children from camp, and uh, they should always claim that they were not Jews. So a few days before Buchenwald was liberated, and the American tanks were already only a few miles away, the Nazis decided the SS to liquidate the children and uh, uh, the children in block number eight, uh, one of the blocks in, uh, in uh, Buchenwald, and the children were paraded, and an SS officer said, anyone here Jewish, two steps forward. He had trained the children. You're not Jewish, remember, you're Hungarian, you're Czech, you're Polish, you're not Jewish. And he, he instructed them a few German words so they would understand. The SS man says, again, I repeat my order. Anyone Jewish, two step forward. One Jewish boy stepped forward. William Hamann went up to him. Why did you step forward? You're not Jewish. What are you trying to make? You want to make an inquiry? Get back into the ranks. The SS officer suspected that Hamann had, was fooling around. He knew exactly who among these kids over which he was in charge, with 200 kids, was Jewish. The SS officer said, William Hammond, we're going to get back to you and you'll be punished. Suddenly the alarm grew. There was the alarm in the camp. The alarm. What happened? American tanks have been sighted. They could come. The SS, you know, they took off the uniform and they escaped in their underwear and the Americans came in and he had saved these children. One of the children that he saved later on became the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Lau, and today he is the chief rabbi of uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, one of the children, he was then uh, eight years old, Wilhelm Hamann. He survived 12 years of concentration camp and he went back to becoming a communist in the Communist Party in, in, uh, in Germany and he died as a die-hard, eyed communist. He believed in communism. You know, there was a day when being a communist was uh, like today, being a supporter of Trump or something like that. You have to be a communist, you know. This is like the future. This is the list of the children in block number eight uh, that uh, he saved. And uh, here is the name of Lau. Lau Naftali, later on, become a rabbi. Okay. And then we also honored people who did not save, but they protested the German prosecution of the Jews. So quickly, Wagner, Armin Wagner. Armin Wagner in the First World War was a nurse in the German army. 
he witnessed the Armenian genocide. And then uh, when Hitler came to power, he wrote a, a protest, a letter to Hitler. Dear Prime Minister, he didn't call him Dear Führer, why you want to restore Germany to greatness? Go ahead, or why pick on the Jews? You can restore Germany to the Jews are great patriots. They have done a lot for Germany. They have done this and this and this and that. Look at the name of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize for various things, for physics, chemistry, and so on. Why do you want to stain the name of Germany by persecuting the Jews? Okay, he wrote this letter to Hitler and he got a response from his secretary, you will soon hear from us. And indeed, they picked him up and he was in a concentration camp for many years and he was liberated on Hitler's birthday before the war and uh, because his wife was Quaker and uh, that had an influence. To, and uh, we decided that even a person that did not say, but he protested the persecution of Jews by writing directly to Hitler, a German author, and uh, he, he, he suffered from that, he was going to be honored. And here we see uh, Armin Wegner later on, the Israeli ambassador in Rome, he was living in Rome, this is Armin Wegner, uh, he, uh, uh, on the left-hand side. He uh, started his career by protesting the genocide of the Armenians. So uh, he was buried first in Germany. And when Armenia became an independent country, they asked for his body to re be removed to Armenia. So today he is buried in Armenia, uh, Armin Wegner. Here is a Catholic bishop, Lichtenberg, Bernhard. Have you ever heard of that name? Anyone? Okay. <laughs> Me too. So he was in, he was the St. Henrik Church in Berlin. He was anti-Nazi, but uh, he was very careful not to voice his opinion in public. But then from 1941 onwards, whenever there was a mass in the Catholic Church, he he always injected the following sentence. He would say, let us pray for all the people that are suffering now in the war, and let us also pray for the Jews that are suffering. Every, every day at Mass, he would say that. Well, some of the people in the audience, they objected to the fact that he was saying, and let us also pray for the Jews. So they reported him. So he was arrested, and uh, he was uh, charged with disturbing the peace, creating a commotion, and he was sentenced to two years in jail. While he was in jail, he was visited by the cardinal, the Catholic cardinal in Berlin, and he told him to Lichtenberg, Lichtenberg, when you're released from jail, I go to the Vatican, I got a message uh, from the Pope, Pius XII, he sent you his best greetings. I also spoke to the Gestapo. They said, after you're released, after two years, if you keep your mouth shut and you don't speak about the Jews, nothing will happen to you. But if after you're released, you again speak about the Jews, you're going to have to face severe consequences. He said, I will not keep my mouth shut. I will only, I will speak uh, uh, whatever I think I, I should say based on my Christian beliefs. Now, he was released. Now, here, when he was originally arrested, he was interrogated by the Gestapo. And the Gestapo asked him, why do you say, let us pray for the Jews? Okay, haven't you read my Kampf, page 235, where Hitler says something about the Jews, and we should pray for the Jews. The Führer has made it very clear who the Jews are. So this is the interrogation from the Gestapo, which is, which is uh, online. I mean, you can get it. And this is his response. I spiritually oppose the deportation of Jews with all its consequences because it against, it goes against the beliefs of true Christianity. There's a T missing here, or the R should have been a T. True Christianity, you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I consider the Jews also my neighbor who have a mortally created soul that's the image of all likeness of God. And then he was asked, what about the Führer, what he said to Mein Kampf? And this is his response. I do not consider Hitler as a prophet sent by God. I state with steadfast conviction 
that the National Socialist ideology is incompatible with the teaching and commands of the Catholic Church. Now, when you say that to the Gestapo, it's like, you know, sen sen uh, it's like writing your own uh, death sentence. But he was only sentenced to two years. After two years, when he said, I will speak up again, against what's happening to the Jews, he was taken by the Gestapo. They were ready to get to prison when he was released. They took him to Dachau, concentration camp, and there he died. His body was after the war. He was declared, he was beatified by the Catholic Church. He considered the saint. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the sentencing of, uh, from the Gestapo file in 1943. Uh, and it says, uh, this is after, in 1943, when he was about to be released. This is the Gestapo document. It says, uh, that after he was going to be re uh, released, after his release from the prison, he is to be sent to a concentration camp. Anyone here know some German? No one. The last line. Seine Einweisung in eine Konzentrationslager Verfügt, Staatspolizei in Berlin. He died, he was beaten and he died in Dachau because he was not going to remain silent and he was going to continue to pray from the pulpit. I will pray for the Jews and for all the others who were suffering in the war. He was not going to give up on that. A Catholic bishop. So protest. You may not have saved personally, but you may have influenced others to try to save. Okay, and the final thing is we have a garden at Yad Vashem, where we have trees for all these people that saved Jews. And uh, these people, they receive also uh, a medal. And on the medal is written in Hebrew and in French, because originally uh, when the program was launched, the, the official foreign language of Israel was French, not English. Today it's English. And there's a statement from uh, the Talmud on the medal. It says, for this reason was man created alone. I mean, the, the, there's a discussion in the Talmud by the rabbis. Why did God create mankind with one man, Adam? Why one? Why not a hundred? Why create just one? And so the discussion by the rabbis, and one rabbi gave the following answer. For this reason was man created alone, to teach that whosoever destroys a single life it is as though he had destroyed an entire world. And whosoever that preserves a single life, it is as though he had preserved an entire world. Therefore, every single person is obliged to say, the world was created for my sake. Very beautiful statement in the Talmud. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much.